So, hello everyone. Hello. Uh, now, I suppose I should introduce myself to most of the class one that doesn't know me. I'm Giuseppe Lazzarda. I come from Italy. I have a PhD in computer science with a specialization in uh, programming languages for game development. So I'm a weird mixture between a theoretician and a game developer. Uh, and yes, as you probably guessed by now, I'm going to teach physics to you in the coming world. Now, we will start with an overview of the course. And actually, before even the overview, this is a promise I can do to you from the very start. This course is going to be tough. I'm sorry, there's no sugar in this. Uh, physics is inherently tough. There's no way to fake the physics to the point that it becomes simple for a game. So if you want to do something that works in a game, you're going to have to go the full, full length of high-quality Newtonian physics. And this is tough, all right? What's going to happen, though, hopefully, to all of you, is that you will know how to build a physics engine that is capable of supporting collision detection, uh, stacking lots of objects, uh, colliding with each other, bouncing off each other, coming to rest on top of each other in weird manners, uh, supporting friction, supporting... Um, uh, supporting friction, supporting uh, constraints, some basic introduction to inverse kinematics. And uh, as a last lecture, there's going to be something to, uh, some, some talk about two very obvious additions that you need in a physics engine, which are cars and bullets, right? Because I thought, well, the dynamics and the kinematics are useful to a point. If you can shoot anything from a height speed, uh, from, a, uh, from a fast moving car, then come on, what's the point? <laughs> so, uh, there's going to be, these are going to be the five topics of the course. The first one is going to be basic concepts from physics. So we'll, we'll talk right away about translational and rotational physics. So if you have an object, how does it move? How does it rotate? How does the, the second law, uh, the Newton's second law apply to physics? Because that, that's what it really boils down to. Then, of course, we're going to be talking about collision detection. And that's going to be the hardest part of the course. That's going to be important. Uh, we're, we'll talk about the narrow phase of collision detection. So say you have two meshes. Uh, you want to know when they collide and where they collide. Very precisely, of course, because you need to know exactly where they get to touch each other to, to, to know how to respond to that. Then we'll see how to do the same kind of collision detection, but uh, the so-called road phase, so at a much lower resolution which is obviously going to be less precise, but it's also going to be far faster. And we'll see how we can combine these two to quickly determine the answer to the question what objects are colliding precisely. Of course, at this point, we'll know how to move objects, how to rotate objects, how to find out when objects are colliding, and, well, we need to respond to the collisions. But the collisions may be very complex, because it's not just a matter of two objects colliding and bouncing away. First of all, they start rotating, which and it's weirdness to the system. But far more importantly, imagine you have lots of, well, have you ever played Legos? Yes. No. All right, whoever's had a childhood. So you put a bunch of Legos in a box, right? How many collisions do you get? Right? <laughs> Too many. That's what we want to be able to solve. So we'll see how we can resolve simultaneously multiple collisions. And we'll find out that we can actually generalize this method to also solve uh, constraints like arms, joints, uh, um, topic that by some is considered very, very important in physics, which is, uh, oh, hello, how to solve the springs <laughs> in this system. Uh, and finally, as, say, a little bonus, uh, we'll all talk about how to compute some forces, so ballistic forces, shooting stuff. And car forces. Oh, there's the dynamic planes. Sorry, that's a lie. If we get the time, and I'm, I'm trying to squeeze this in anyway because this is interesting, at least to know that these topics exist if you ever need to study them. Uh, I'm going to talk about how, what kind of pre processing you do of models for uh, making collision detection faster and how you com compute the, the inertia tensor, the tendency of an object to rotate around its, its center of mass of an arbitrary mesh. So we'll try to, uh, to, to show you these things. Uh, the, the, the materials, this is all the stuff that I've been studying for this course. Uh, the absolute core is the book Game Physics, second edition by David Eberle. 
Now this is a thousand page tome. Every page contains upward of 10 to 15 line long equations, but it's worth it. It's just for being physics. Uh, this is the Bible. If you ever want to buy a huh? reference yeah. book, so well, <laughs> buy this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also very, very expensive. It costs upward of uh, $100. Uh, then there's the book. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, I also studied this book, and I put it there to not recommend it. So never, ever buy this book. This book is a lie, right? Just like a cake. Uh, so do not. Uh, then there's a paper, Iterative Dynamics with Temporal Coherence, which uh, appeared at GDC 2005 and changed the landscape of collision detection. This is what we're going to be using. This is absolutely fundamental. Learn these two names, David Eberle and Eric Kaptos by, by heart, okay? And check their, their pictures, because if you ever cross paths with them, just, just I don't know, bow, <laughs> not rock, whatever. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to be using a couple of additional useful resources, which are less, less central. Okay. Now, the lectures are going to feel theoretical. They are not. There's a lot of theoretical stuff that is not there. Whatever we're going to see, there's going to be equations and, and stuff like this, obviously, that needs to be directly translated into code. So none of what you see is theoretical for the point of theory. Whatever you're going to see is going to have to end up implemented one way or another. All right? And the exam is indeed going to be just a series of assignments. There is no actual exam discourse. Uh, the assignments are going to be due at the end of the week after the presentation of a topic in class. The topics are not one per lecture, so don't worry. There's going to be roughly 1.5 lectures per assignment. Uh, or you can send the assignments all together at the end of the course, but you're not going to make it. So do them weekly. Trust me. So you can obviously try, but it's going to be so crushingly hard to do it in, in a couple of weeks at the end of the course. Uh, the coding, you can do in groups. That's fine. That's not what I'm going to grade. That's a part of what I'm going to grade. What I'm going to grade is an individual report. I want you to describe me what you've done. I want you to be aware of what concepts are in what you implemented and how well they work. I want an overview of the code, of course, but I don't want a dump of the code naturally because, well, here's it. Uh, you can put videos, pictures of what you've done. So you, you need to have something that works, but you also will need to write something about it. Uh, the report has to be short, say 500 words, all right? I want to make sure that every single one of you has the necessary knowledge and awareness of what went into the practical part. But I also want you guys to do the practical part. Okay. All right, and these are the assignments. So first of all, a basic kinematic simulator with Runga-Kutta 2 or 4, uh, uh, separating axis test and contact manifold computation, so this is precise collision detection, uh, at least for op uh, oriented bounding boxes. No joke, oriented bounding boxes are, well, Uh, <laughs> then there's uh, going to be collision calling with bounding sphere, axis line bounding boxes, and bins. Uh, there's a awesome algorithm for finding the collision detection between axis line bounding boxes that's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. That's one of the most awesome things of these courses. Uh, there's going to be collision response, and then there's going to be cars and projectiles. Now, the most mathematically able among you have noticed that the sum is not 100%, right? Uh, the assumption is not that you have to do all of this. Now, in, a, in five minutes we're going to get into equations and all the, the, the fun stuff, but before that I want to share the rationale behind the course. Would you rather have a course which doesn't teach you physics? Who would? Raise your hand. Did you raise your hand? <laughs> the point is, this is the only way to do physics in a way that allows you to understand and even possibly build an actual physics engine. Okay, kinematics, collision detection, collision response. You cannot do a physics engine without this, right? You don't know what a physics engine is, right? This is at the core. Everything else is just sugar on top of it, and it's actually trivial sugar. Uh, the problem is that I also accept that not all of you want to become physics programmers. So the idea is that you can not do everything and still pass the course with a reasonable understanding of physics. For example, this one here, this is going to be very tough, very tough. And, and, and I accept that some of you do not want to spend uh, a nice chunk of your neurons and burn them away on understanding how to do that. That's fine. All right? And the point of the course is that 
I'm not going to try to hold you, to hold this against you, all right? But if you really want to do a game physics engine that you can go to GDC and showcase and people will say this is an excellent physics engine, then yes, this is all that you have to learn to do, all right? Okay, so at this point, uh, well, okay, this is a bit premature, so no. <laughs> Thank you. So let's go to really lecture one. Um. Okay, so at this point we move on. Uh, the lectures are, I think, all on med school, besides lecture eight, which I'm getting ready. So they're all done, they're all on med school, you can already start uh, thinking of them. So now what we talk about is, as the title suggests, basic concepts of physics. Now we'll see kinematics, we'll see Newton's laws. We'll see torque. Do you, does anyone here uh, know what torque is? Well, you know again. Uh, okay. The rotational application of force. Yes, indeed. Then we'll talk about momenta, which is the tendency of a body to maintain motion. Moving motion, linear motion, but also rotational motion. Uh, we'll talk about the center of mass, which is the quantity around which the whole body, uh, the whole body momenta are expressed. We'll talk about the moment of inertia, which is the rotational equivalent to mass. So it's the tendency of the object to resist rotation along its axis. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have an overview of what you actually have to implement to, to make this true. Okay. So, kinematics indeed is the study of motion. We need to track uh, information about the position, the velocity, and the acceleration. Do you know what these quantities are? Position. But the fact that it's moving means that it has a velocity. But if it's accelerating, if it's going from standstill to movement, this is of course the, the acceleration, right? Doesn't get that much more intuitive, right? Uh, the same goes for the rotational part. So we have a rotation, the angle, so to say, at which the object is currently standing rotated, we have the angular velocity, so how fast is it moving? Imagine a spinning object, a fan for example, and that is its angular velocity, it's around its horizontal axis. And the torque is the force that is being applied to make the rotating object rotate faster or slower and yeah. low. I've got my jacket, can I just yeah. it? <laughs> By all means, get it back. Uh, these objects, uh, these quantities, are all expressed in an arbitrary set of Cartesian coordinates in 2D or 3D, right? Of course, in 3D, we're going to have more data. And surprisingly, so in 2D, everything is, remains very simple. As soon as you add the third axis, everything kind of blows up in complexity. That's, that, that, yeah, that, that's a new little joke uh, from, from God to game programmers. Uh, OK. Uh, now, what governs the way uh, bodies behave is a very, well, a rather old <laughs> concept, which is Newton's laws of motion. Oh, of course, which we'll see in a bit. This is still the introduction, yeah. Uh, and the Newton's laws of motion go and act onto a concept which is linear and angular momentum. Now, if an object is moving very fast, right, it's easy to stop it. Yeah, obviously not. Or if an object is very, very heavy and it's moving against you, imagine a freight train, right? Try to stop that. Okay? Uh, Bring it. So, velocity is not enough in describing motion, right? You have a mixture of how heavy the object is and how fast it's moving, right? I'd rather not try to stop a projectile just as I'd rather not try to stop a freight train, right? So, the, this concept, and the same goes for momentum, of course. So imagine one of those uh, uh, Final Destination movies where some gigantic object is rotating against you, menacing to crush you. You don't try to stop its rotation, you just get out of the way. And so the same concept of the strong tendency of an object to move also applies to, to its rotation. A very heavy object that's rotating, you do not get in the way. Uh, of course, uh, whereas linear momentum is very easy to figure that the object is moving against you, right? And okay, it's obvious what it's going to do. 
angular momentum is rather less intuitive because the rotation is not necessarily going to be serve, serve, it's not going to be behaving in a homogeneous manner. It depends on uh, around which axis the object is rotating. All right. So, for example, I couldn't do a backflip for the life of me, but I can easily do this. Right. This is far easier. Okay. Now imagine you pick a couple of strong students and you try to rotate my own body like this. Okay. This is going to be harder if you want to try to rotate me uh, with a pirouette, as I just did, and that's not going to be very hard. So the tendency of an object to move is described by the center around which all rotations of the object happen. So all rotations will happen around the center of mass, and its tendency to turn, which is the inertia tensor, which is a quantity, not a single value, but actually a matrix of values, which describes the tendency of the object to resist motion in various axes. And finally, the torque is indeed the force that you apply to the object. So if you push me here on my shoulder, what's going to happen? I'm going to start rotating, right? Okay? So that's torque. Torque also depends a lot on where you apply the force. So if you apply the force very far from the center of mass, you're going to get a different result than what you would get uh, from applying it somewhere else. Okay, now, let's start getting some details uh, so techni technical details inside. Let's start talking about a particle, a single particle that's moving across the xy plane, right? Can you figure this out? You have a particle, xy plane, right? How do we describe it? We describe it with two values uh, x of t plus y of t. Are you familiar with this notation? This is the complex number notation. Who is familiar with it? Who is not familiar with it? Who is neither? <laughs> Okay, so uh, you can uh, write i and j, which stand from respectively the x-axis and the y-axis. So this is nothing weird. Or you can just put the value where the axes are 1, 0, and 0, 1. So if you multiply x by this axis by i, you're going to get x0. And when you multiply y by j, you're going to get 0y. When you sum this together, you're going to get x, y. You can also write it like this. Okay? The notation is absolutely immaterial, so I am going to jump from notation to notation to my own convenience. So just realize that, yeah. So. Now, the velocity of the particle at time t is going to be called, oh, sorry, the position is going to be called r of t most of the time. The velocity is going to be called v of t, and it's going to be the derivative of the position with respect to time. <coughs> Am I yet losing someone? Okay, good. The derivative, so how much the position changes with respect of, to time, which is kind of a very obvious way to describe the velocity. And of course, uh, this means that, well, the x component of the velocity is going to say how much the x position changes across time, whereas the y component of the velocity is going to say how the uh, y position changes across time. A new quantity, which is speed, is the length of the vector v. The length of the vector v says, in general, not on the x-axis or on the y-axis, but in general, how much the object is moving, how fast the object is moving, that is its speed. We're still remaining in the very intuitive realm. The acceleration is how much the velocity changes over time. So v dot, is the dot notation confusing anyone? All right, well, it is just derivative. So rem just remember that relationship. It, it's much easier to write, of course, a, a dot rather than the, the, the full derivative. So the acceleration is the velocity derived by time. So how much the velocity changes over time? That is how much the position changes over time twice. Well, still rather simple. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Okay, now, oh my God. <laughs> the tangent of the movement is the normalized velocity. Do not look at the second part. Do not look at the cosine of the sine. This, this is actually, well, if, you, if you're interested, just, just know that this is the current angle of the curve that the part, particle is describing. But far, far, far more important is the fact that the velocity by itself is not just a direction because it's also got a length, right? But when you normalize the velocity, and the normalized velocity is a very important quantity, you just get the direction, the unit length direction, 
where the particle is moving towards, right? So your front vector, so to speak. So your velocity is not your front vector, it's your velocity. If you want to know where you're going, just the direction, then that is the tangent. And perpendicular to the tangent, we have the normal, the normal of the curve. So, uh, well, of course, the technology comes to the rescue. So imagine, <laughs> your particle is moving, right? Take this point here, right? So, it's tangent, it's velocity, well, it depends on how fast it's going, let's say its velocity is something like this, right? And let's say this is long, I don't know, 3 units, 4 units, 5 units, who cares? The tangent, though, is going to be normalized velocity, right? Just one vector. And the normal is going to be the perpendicular vector to the movement, right? And when you take the point, R here, a little point, okay, the tangent and the normal, this is called the moving frame of the particle. So the particle is forward vector and it's and it's forward and up. Upward. And it's up vector, right? So this is right, the the, sp the relative space as seen from the moving object, right? Is everyone with me? Excellent. <coughs> okay, now. Nah, who cares? This is, this is too hard. I, I, I put details. If you want to look them up, all of these are useful. They make everything clear, but don't worry. So now we add the Z component. So we have a particle moving in space. Now the position is going to have X, Y, and Seriously, guys, when I ask a question like this, shout the answer. <laughs> Z. Z. Okay. Or we can, we can have it like this, I, J, or L, or we can have it like this, in tubal version. And it's still going to be called R. The velocity, very same concept, just with another, <coughs> just with another component. The speed, exactly the same concept. The length of the velocity. The acceleration, derivative of the velocity, or derivative, derivative two times on the position. Okay, tangent is the very same thing. So you have a particle, now the particle is moving in 3D, okay? Like a camera, for example. Uh, what's the forward direction? The tangent, all right? And the tangent is going to still be the normalized velocity. Now, of course, and at this point you say, okay, then now you just add normal, and no, you can't add normal because Imagine you have the, the particle is moving in 3D like this, okay? How many normals can you pick? Many. Infinite. So perpendicular. You have movement, but perpendicularly. Can you visualize this? Is this picture clear enough? So this circle is the circle of all the possible normals. But then, well, and what difference does it make? What normal you pick? Well, okay. I'm, I'm the particle, my face is the particle, right? My tangent is, well, my nose, which makes it evident enough, I think. Uh, so my up vector is my normal, okay? To me, personally, it makes a very big difference if this is my normal or this is my normal, right? You see the point? So we need something else. What we need is the binormal. So now we have three vectors, which are the tangent, the normal, and the binormal. The tangent is my forward vector. The normal is my up vector. And the binormal is my right hand rule. Tangent. Oh no, wait a second. Oh yes, it's my right vector. <laughs> okay. And the binormal the changes in the binormal actually represent the tendency of the object to kind of screw in, you see, like rotating. So you have the object, it's moving, it's easier to rotate this than my, than my, than my neck. It's this tendency, the change in the binormal and the normal does this, right? Okay.
and the moving frame of the particle is the r position, the tangent, the, on, the n vector, and the b vector. All right. Now, it may surprise you to find out that if you take these three vectors, uh, are these three vectors perpendicular to each other? Of course they are, right? Now what happens if you put three vectors perpendicular to each other and you use them, say, as the columns of a matrix? What happens? The matrix is? Sorry? You use them as the columns of a matrix. Three vectors perpendicular to each other. Yeah, yeah, just shout the answer. You get a rotation matrix. You get a rotation matrix. All right? And surprisingly so, the rotation... So you see, you, you actually need these vectors very much for an intuitive reason. Forward, up, and right. Okay? You can't really do without. Otherwise, you cannot describe the motion of an object. And oh, you can actually put them together as a matrix. But you can actually split them together uh, from a matrix. And you know what's right, forward, and up are. All right? This is already, I think, a rather useful and interesting tidbit. So please do not forget this. this the, the forgetting this as a rather high cost in this first group dividing. Uh, okay, all right. Oh, indeed, there was the answer. Uh, now, suppose you have a body. Oh, here I'm arbitrarily changing notation. So x is now just the, the vector, the position, the vector position of the center of a body, right? So x is the position of the body, of the center of the body, and you have a vector r zero, uh, which well is a vector in the body. So let's say you have x here, and you have a vector which, when the body was originally created, was at that position. All right, but you rotate this body. All right with the matrix defined as T and B. You have the T and B matrix, which is the rotation matrix of your body. Okay? Where does the R0 point end up? This is actually on the slide, but the most important bit, of course, is understanding it is. You take R0. Oh, of course, R0 is this vector here. So R0 is created when x is the origin. When the whole body rotates, and it rotates around the x vector, the rotation, the rotation matrix, say it does something like this. This is the rotation matrix. It's a simple rotation matrix. It just rotates around the vertical axis, right? So where's R0 going to end up? It's rather obviously going to end up here in the picture. So first we rotate R0 by multiplying it by the rotation matrix and then we move R0 with the rest of the object by summing the, the x vector. Who is lost and, and why most importantly? Yeah, it's interesting. following so far? Raise your hand courage courageously. Okay. So, imagine you have a point in an object. Okay, alright. Find the object. This is the point. Okay. This is the origin. My feet are firmly planted on the origin of the word. Okay? Of the game word. Alright? So, now, I want to rotate and translate myself. Okay? So, the question is, where does this object end up? Right? Now, my arm is fortunately enough, not going to be broken or twisted or anything during translation and rotation, right? So I'm just going to move as a whole body, okay? So, do I have to translate or rotate first? Yes. I have to rotate first, okay? So first I rotate, okay? Now I translate, I'll go there, okay? And this is where I end up, alright? Okay? So, first you rotate, then you translate. Okay? Let's do the opposite. I'm here, okay? 
Let's translate. I go there. Okay? The origin is there. So when I rotate now, I'm going to rotate around the origin. So the point ends up here, which is not what you wanted. All right? Rotation first, translation after. Okay? All right. We also store the angular velocity of the body. So it may be that your body, it will most likely be in a cave, that your body doesn't just have a rotation. The rotation means what's, what its current orientation is, right? But its orientation, the R matrix itself may be changing. Here. Look this carefully. Look at this carefully. Do you see the rotation? Right? Does the rotation change? Yes? Does it change faster now? <coughs> so the rotational velocity is different from the first row to the second, right? This rotational velocity, what does it change? The rotation and the rotation. How are we representing the rotation? Oops. As the rotation matrix, right? So the velocity, the angular velocity, which is just a vector, represents the x, it's a vector, x, y, z. Its normalization is the axis around which the body is rotating. So for an object that's rotating like this, the axis is going to be this axis here and the length of the vector is the number of rotations in radiances per second All right. so the longer the vector, the faster the object is spinning the direction of the vector is the axis around which the object is rotating alright so the question is that there is an apparent mismatch because W is a vector which determines how the rotation matrix changes. So the position and the velocity, which map to the rotation and the rotational velocity. So you see the parallel. You have the rotation and you have the position. The position has associated a velocity and the rotation has associated a, an, an angular velocity. All right? So they, they are the very same concept, but the problem is that the rotational velocity is a vector, but this is a matrix. Sorry? We need an identity matrix. Oh no, unfortunately, not even that. This vector here changes the rotation, so this vector here changes the matrix. So the question is how do you take a vector, a velocity, an angular velocity, and you change a rotation matrix with the angular velocity? Alright? This is a very useful question actually. With a with an nicely other people answer. So what we do is that we have to find a way to determine the derivative with respect to time of the rotation. Now mind you, when you've done this, when you've finished doing this, you have objects that can rotate and translate naturally. So you can have an object of an arbitrary shape moving and rotating around space in the correct manner. So the payoff for this is actually very, very big. Now, before studying the rotation matrix as a whole, because the rotation, ju just imagining deriving a rotation matrix, it, it is a, well, it's a hellish endeavor. So, we wonder what happens to a single point, R of T, in the body, as the body rotates. Now, uh, I really need a marker though. Do it should be a three when I hunt for a marker. Oh yeah, that's Oh no. And now? Do I write on this thing? No. Yeah. Sure, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Try it. It has a special way of yeah, it's handling. <laughs> Ta-da! Okay. Right. So, um, so, I was saying, we're trying to determine how the rotation matrix changes with a rotational velocity, right? 
So we have a current rotation matrix, T and V vectors, from up to the right. We have a velocity, like say the velocity is 200, zero, zero, so it means two radiuses per second around the x-axis. Alright? A super simple question. With a not so obvious answer. Uh, so it's rather hard to study the way the whole matrix as a whole, as a matrix, changes. So we take a step back and the trick is that we wonder how the axis of the matrix change with the velocity, which apparently is much, much easier. So we have, I can write on this, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, come on, then. You, you ruin a thousand dollar or euro. We won't tell. Uh... <laughs> First evidence, you know. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, this is being recorded, right? So, Oh, yeah. I'll delete it. I got a guy for that. Okay, so. I'll <laughs> no. just Photoshop you now. Well, so, please use a bit of imagination. Okay, so we have this body here, and this is the shape of the body. This is the center of mass of the body, so it may be that this part is very heavy and this is very light. And this is an arbitrary point, okay? Now, imagine that. So, we have now an axis, an axis of rotation. So if the object is rotating, say, around its center, the object is rotating like this, okay? What's the axis of rotation? What's W? We, we, we said that W, the angular velocity, is the axis of rotation, right? So what's the axis of rotation in this case? Yeah, come on, don't worry, guys. I'm not eating anyone. Yeah? Z. Sorry? Z. Z, that is? So, is it going to be this one, this one, or this one? This one, okay? Right, perfect. This is the axis of rotation, okay? Right? Does, it, does, any, does everyone agree? <laughs> okay, alright. So, this means that in this instant, this object, where is it going? In what direction? Right? So, if I, it's, it has a, a velocity, it's velo it has a velocity, the velocity is just a vector, but then, then the vector changes, of course. But so, at this moment, at this instant, what's its velocity? It's here, right? Okay. And this velocity, well, this velocity, hello, happens to be perpendicular to this vector, right, to this axis, because you're rotating around the center, so you're moving away from your own axis. Imagine, uh, imagine that, well, the object is, is, this is a point in the object, and this is the rotation center of the object. So the physical, the, the molecules, molecules of, 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 that connect the two objects are actually acting like a rope or a piece that, that's connecting the two, right? So the only movement is going to be perpendicular to the rope. Have you ever swing, uh, been swinging a rope? That is exactly the same thing that happens, but the rope is now made of molecules, well, as it was before, but they're rigidly connected. Uh, the velocity vector is also perpendicular to the rotation axis, right? This is actually quite obvious. So if the object is rotating around the axis, well, then every rotational movement is going to be perpendicular to the axis, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be rotational movement. It would be translational movement. So, the velocity is going to be equal to the r vector. Oh, yeah, sorry, other way around. It's going to be the angular velocity times rt. Cross products. What happens when you cross two vectors? You get a vector that is. Perpendicular. Now we've kind of gone backwards in this. So we know that the velocity has to be perpendicular to both vectors. So there's only one way to find the vector. So if you have two vectors and there, and you want to have another one that's perpendicular to both, the only way to get it out is actually with the cross product. So there is no black magic here. All right. Uh, so, but of course the object is also. Oh yeah, of course. So this is the velocity. So this is the velocity, right? So if you want to know how r is changing due to the rotation, there you go. 
This is your answer. Now, we have three very interesting vectors, which are T and, and B. And you can imagine these as being points in the object. And if you cross these vectors with the, with the angular velocity, you know how the axis of the rotation matrix are rotating due to the rotation, the angular velocity. Just as you would have rotated a single point of the body. Because, I mean, who cares? Where is R? We don't know, we don't care. It's any point in the body. Okay? And T and N B, they may be in or outside the body, but you can imagine that they, they, they are linked to the body. So, if you take W times T, W times N, and W times P, you get the way the columns of the rotation matrix change over time. Alright? You put this together in a single matrix, and this matrix is the derivative of the rotation with respect to time. I understand this is a lot of data, but this is not hard. It kind of looks because of all the symbols, but it isn't. Are you kind of getting where, where, where we're going? So, and this is a trick that we're going to use in physics a lot. When something is big, like a whole rotation matrix, how do you integrate a rotation matrix? Well, you don't. Come on, that's too hard. You split it into manageable concepts, like three single vectors, T and B. Now, we know how to rotate vectors around the body. So that's what we have done. All right. Do you guys want to take a break? An actual break? Yay. Yeah. Then break. <laughs> So, with a bit of tinkering, you would be able to take a cube, change by sliders its velocity or its angular velocity, and see it move and rotate as it should do, which is already a very good start. Now, uh, what if you want to make the object accelerate its rotation or its movement in a manner that is physically meaningful? So, not just with sliders, right? For example, you have gravity, or you have someone pushing the cube, or whatever. Well, in general, what we get to talk about is force and inertia. Now, inertia is indeed the tendency of an object to maintain its motion. Imagine something very heavy rotating or moving. It's the same. It doesn't want to stop because it's heavy, right? But also imagine, uh, imagine a very long metal pole, all right? Okay. If you want to rotate a long metal pole, is it the same the axis of rotation? Imagine this is much longer and much heavier, all right? What's the easiest way to rotate this? Roll. Roll. Rolling, right? Okay, if you want to do this, it's going to be very heavy. If you want to do this, it's going to be rather almost as heavy, but there is no gravity involved, so it's going to be a tiny bit simpler. Okay, so the inertia, well, for the movement, so if you just throw this, its tendency to, 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 to maintain motion is going to be roughly the same. It doesn't, doesn't change that much, uh, the rotation. But its tendency to keep rotating is going to change, because if I... Well, if it's rotating like this at one spin per minute, or if it's rotating like this at one spin per second, sorry, this rotation contains far more energy, and so it's going to be harder to stop the object from rotating in this manner, okay? So, when you apply a force, you change motion or, uh, well, angular motion or linear motion. And inertia is the tendency to resist the application of force. Now, uh, Newton's laws actually go and describe these tendencies. So, the first law is indeed, in the absence of external forces, an object at rest will remain at rest, okay? So this means, and uh, if the object is in motion, no external forces act on it, so the object remains in motion with constant velocity. And of course, angular velocity, this was implied. So only <coughs> forces, the forces are the only thing in physics that are capable of changing an object's motion. This you can already do. You can already build this. So from this slide to the previous ones, you can already build something that simulates, uh, simulates uh, Newton's first law of motion. 
And they actually, they actually have been recommended in this. The second law, oh, this is bigger, but for an object of constant mass over time, its acceleration, A, is proportional to the force F and inversely proportional to the mass M of the object. So the acceleration is the force divided by the mass. This shouldn't come as a big shock to anyone here. Oh my god! Who's shocked? <laughs> Alright? Now, the general statement of the law is this. So, the force is equal to uh, the derivative with respect to time of mass, uh, sorry, uh, of um, uh, mass, oh, uh, there's a small mistake actually. Oops. Dun, dun, dun. It's mass times derivative uh, with respect to velocity plus the derivative of mass with respect to time times velocity. So if you have an object that's changing its mass, then Newton's law doesn't really apply because the force uh, also talks about the change of mass. But in general, in a game, you don't have objects that change mass, right? So your bullets maintain their mass until they hit the, the target. Uh, the quantity, m times b, is called the linear momentum of the object. So the second law is actually saying that the application of a, of a force Chain causes a change in the momentum of the object. So what changes when you apply a force is not just the velocity. What changes is the product of the mass times the velocity. Okay? All right. But in general, what this means is that the path of motion, so the way the path of motion is complex, is determined by is determined from the externally applied forces. And the third, the third law is yeah kind of relevant for. Uh, I don't know who, whoever uses this. Uh, if a force is exerted in one object, there is a force of equal magnitude, but of opposite direction on some other one. So you always push against something else to apply a force. Right? What we really use is the second law. What we really care about is the fact that the force is equal to mass times acceleration. Right? So if you usually have a force, and what you compute is the acceleration of your body by dividing the force by the mass. This is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and of course, we're always, uh, we're always talking about the inertial frame. So forces are vectors, naturally, because the, the acceleration is a vector, the velocity is a vector, the position is a vector, and naturally, the force is a vector itself. OK. Now, of course, when you apply a force to an object, right? remember the example of pushing a lecturer on the shoulder. right? When you push me like this, two things are actually going to happen, right? The first one, oh, okay, so let's start with something easier. You push me here, all right? Vertic uh, horizontally, this is my center of mass, okay? You push me here, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna start rotating? No, I'll push myself. No, I'm not gonna start rotating, okay? If you push me here, though, am I gonna start rotating? Of course, I am, but I'm not just gonna start rotating because I'm also a little bit going to start moving backwards, right? Because this pressure isn't just a rotational pressure. To make me start rotating, what would you have to do? The forces. All right. So you would need to counterbalance the, the, the movement. All right. But we, so, in general, you apply force, and a chunk of the force you apply is translated into linear linear acceleration, and a part of it is going to be translated into uh, torque into angular acceleration, all right? So a part of pushing me on the shoulder makes me actually go backwards. But, a but, a but most of it, because this is rather, rather far from my center, makes me rotate. Okay, so it's probably 90% makes me rotate and 10% makes me move, all right? You can imagine also uh, nuts, removing nuts with a wrench. Is your English? Do, do you talk about removing nuts with a wrench? <laughs> Okay, now, uh, as you can imagine, I have a teaching of computer science and I'm teaching physics, so I do not draw well, okay? This is kind of a given, in this case, it's the part of my brain that allowed me to draw has been apparently removed. So, uh, is a nut. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and this is the wrench. Okay? You missed your calling. 
Sorry? You missed oh. your call by fish. I know, I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's a tablet spot. It doesn't get my my art. Uh, so where do you put the pressure? Usually you put the pressure here or in general on the handle, right? But what happens is that the nut rotates, right? Okay. Uh, if you take a very short wrench, say your fingers, and you try to rotate a long nut, what's going to happen? Oh. You hurt your fingers. Yeah, you're going to break your fingers, right? So, if you take a very long wrench, say a couple of meters, okay, and you push with all your body slowly, you're not going to feel anything, right? Because you're going to move, but a long movement with all your strength is going to translate into a tiny rotation, right? Because you make a movement like this, but it's very far, so you're moving a very tiny angle, like, I don't know, 10, 20 degrees, right? Whereas with your fingers, every movement translates to exactly rotating the thing. So the longer and the further uh, you apply the strength with respect to where you want the object to rotate, the less force, the less torque you apply, and the easier the, the, the thing is going to rotate, because most of your force is going to go in the right direction. Okay. All right, this is another. Yeah, I, I, I used the horrible pictures from all over the web. Not only can I draw. Yeah, this yeah, that's what we did, yeah. So not only can I draw, but I cannot even find my pictures. And what happens is that, so you have the force, okay? Should we and, use it? Sorry? Should we use it? Yeah, of course. The force. Should we use it. Oh my god. <laughs> Just join the dark side, it's all over. Sorry. Could you delete the last five minutes? <laughs> I can't, sorry. <laughs> Alright, so, yes, we are using the force, which is the blue vector, okay? R is, you see, the relative position, the relative vector to go from the, the center of rotation to the point that we're applying the rotation to, right? So R usually it's like a bit like a radius. That's the reason why you pick R as letter. It means how you get to the relative point. And the rotation axis, which we call tau, is this one. It's perpendicular. Does, does this sound right to you? But how do you compute? So what quantities do you have in this case? You have the if you have the the, the, the nut, it's still, it's not moving. And you know what, where you apply the force. You, you apply the force here. So knowing that you apply the force here tells you R. Right? Yeah. R is the point where you're applying the force, so you, you know that intrinsically. And the direction of the force, well, yeah, you know. Are you pulling? Are you pushing? Okay? So you know R and you know F. And now you want to know where is the rotation going to happen. Right? And the rotation... Well, you can see quite clearly, the rotation has to be perpendicular to R and has to be perpendicular to the force itself. Take a look. Is, is this common experience to you? Is it what always happens? And R and, uh, R and both R and F perpendicular to, to, to the force, to the, to, to the axis of rotation. I would rather say yes, please. Answer yes, yes. please. Yes. yes! Okay, all right. Now, because if I lose you here, then, then it's kind of a problem for, for the course. Okay, so, as, as we said before, what's the only way to find out a vector that's perpendicular to two others? Cross. You cross, okay? All right. So, when you take the force and you cross with, with R, do not change R and F. R times F and F times R are not the same. Uh, what's going to happen is that the torque is going to be in the other direction, okay? So it's like, exactly, it's like negating one. So, mind you, the direction of the cross product is very, very important. But this gives you the torque, all right? And, yeah, what remains of the force is applied linearly. So you could also, so if you're applying some force, you take the cross product, that's the torque, you subtract this to the original force, that's the force that goes into the acceleration of the object. But this should be kind of obvious. Okay, now, the torque is, which is defined as R, R times F, is a vector. 
And this vector has a direction and a Sorry? Oh, see again. No, 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 it's much easier. It's a vector. So it has a direction and a length. I often ask things that are on the slides. <laughs> uh, so the direction, the normalized torque vector, is the axis of rotation. What's going to be the length? Oh, the length of the vector? <laughs> yes, of course, but the length of the vector. What does it represent with respect to the rotation? The speed. A very long torque means, so imagine, but of course, because uh, the length of the torque is going to be the length of R times the length of F, right? And imagine you apply F uh, twice as much as before, now the torque is going to be twice as long. And the rotational speed is going to be twice as long, but this, is, this all depends out. So the length of the torque is in radius per second and represents how fast you're rotating around the axis, okay? All right. If you have a bunch of torques, so you have multiple forces applied to different points, you just compute the various torques and you sum them together. Very simple. So the only interaction between multiple forces on the body is that you sum them all together. You have one force, five forces, ten forces, fifty forces. They do not wear like we shall stop. No, you just sum them. This is good news, right? This, this is an easy thing. Uh, okay, so at this point we have the force and we have the torque. You apply some force or some torque to an object. All right. What happens? Stuff. Sorry. It reacts exactly. <laughs> How? What is this something that you are mentioning? Well, yes, that's a good start. Or. Accelerate and start moving, or stop moving, because you could accelerate in the direction opposite to your movement, which is also called braking, but it's the, the very same concept. It's the first thing that it does, but it could also start rotating, rotating. or better, it could accelerate its rotational velocity, okay? All right. So, uh, and how much does it start moving? Or how much does it start rotating? This is, of course, the most problematic question. And just let you see how far we've gone. Oh, yeah, far enough. Uh, so, what we do is we actually deal with motion. So, in the object and in uh, the rigid body itself that you will implement in a physics game, you will not store the velocity. Well, do answer. Excuse me. Yeah, you do not store the velocity or the angular velocity, but you will store the quantity of motion and the quantity of rotation or of rotational velocity. Uh, this way, when you get some force, you will just change the amount of motion, and then you will translate the amount of motion into velocity. But anyway, and oh yeah, this, who cares now? Oh, no, indeed. This, this I actually have to, to say, just, just like this. <laughs> so, how much motion linearly does the body have? Remember the example. So, how, okay, if I throw this rather fast against a student who doesn't follow the lecture, for example, Ouch. Okay? that's going to hurt a bit, right? Okay. But if I get a cannon and I shoot this against a student with a thousand times more velocity, Man, nothing. you're probably going to do something far more spectacular. <laughs> now, if I take at the same velocity I can throw at my arm, again with a cannon blow, I throw a stone, right? What's going to happen? Once again, spectacular results. Okay? So, uh, the idea is that the mass of the object times its velocity is the important quantity, right? Say uh, I just put delicately a stone, a uh, five kilogram stone, over the student who's not following, right? What's going to happen? Okay, the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> there is going to be something very spectacular, also on the social scale, yes. Uh, so, 
Right, so the point is that the stone is moving very slow, but the results are really going to be spectacular, right? So, okay, I'll use another example. So, let's see, you want to crush eggs? <laughs> no, just kidding. So, uh, the point is this: the spe the, the, how much spectacular the result is going to be depends on the product, of the mass, and the velocity. All right? This is a very intuitive concept. All right? So, uh, for example, one of the one of the reasoning about uh, the fact why are cars dangerous? Because the velocity may not be as fast as a projectile, but the mass more than compensates. What you get roughly is that a shot from a gun has roughly the same amount of, of linear momentum of a car driving in a city, right? So, indeed, cars are as dangerous as a rifle, a, a rifle bullet. And this is actually a physical fact. And, and you well know that the, if you get hit by a car, well, indeed, one can very spectacular results, as we virtually yes. all know. Uh, indeed. So, uh, the quantity that we care a lot about is m times v. Now, we know that the force is equal to m times a. So, the derivative with respect to time of p is going to be the force. Of course, because the derivative, so the mass is constant, right? So the derivative of p with respect to time is the derivative of mass times speed with respect to time. Obviously, just for writing the mass, you can take it out because the mass doesn't change. So you get the mass times the derivative of v with respect to time, mass times a. So the force integrates directly into the linear momentum. That is why you open any physics engine source, the rigid body does not store the velocity directly. Is extension to store linear momentum, right? Okay, because it's easier and more stable to integrate with force. Okay, now how much rotational motion does the body have? Well, we call this quantity big L, and it is the cross product between the point or every point in the body, so this is a random point in the body, which we call R, R, relative to the origin, so this is just a delta vector from the origin to the point, times the linear momentum. The linear momentum is the velocity at which this point is going, but a part of this linear momentum actually applies to the rotation, so R times P tells us what part of this velocity is perpendicular to the, to the R vector, which is indeed uh, the velocity at which the object is rotating multiplied by the mass. So if you remember from before, r times v is actually uh, w. It's actually the angular velocity. So indeed, this is mass, mass times angular velocity. Okay, and indeed, the angular momentum refers to the tendency of the body to rotate around a given axis. And this axis is the vector L, uh, L itself. So L is the vector around which the object is currently rotating. The direction of L and W are actually very, very same. And the length of L is how, how strong this rotational velocity is. So if L is very long, it means that the object is rotating very fast. Now imagine, for example, to try to stop a rotating fan with your hands, right? What happens? Ow, 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 ow. Exactly, right? You don't. Even though the fan itself is it's not very heavy, but it's rotating very fast, so its L is going. Oh, so yeah, this, can anyone describe the L of a rotating uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a fan? This is the fan. Once again, programmers are. I'm not even going to try this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it's rotating like a windmill. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so, what's L? You're hired. What's L? Come on. Where is it in, in the picture? So, I'll give you three options. Is this L? Is this L? Or is this L? Third one. Third one. And how long is it going to be? Always. How long? Oh. Depends on how fast it is. Fans are going. So if the fans are going at one rotation per second, one full rotation per second, L is going to be long. Two pi. 
two point, yes. Because it's in radiuses per second, right? Okay, so it's not in rotations per second. Um, okay, all right. So if you see that the L is long, do not put your hand in the fan, all right? Yes? So is L the same as the torque? No, because the torque is how much L changes. Hello? You're early. Are they? Yeah. So why? This is the physics course. Yes, I know. Oh, okay. Late. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> So, or just um, an hour and a The point is, don't worry, Sorry. it's no problem. Uh, the point is that L says we, uh, around which axis you're rotating and how fast and with how much mass, all right? Okay, so if, you're, if, you're, if, if this beautifully represented fan is made of stone and is large, I don't know, 50 meters of radius, even if it's running very slow, its L is going to be gigantic because L actually contains the mass as well, right? So it's mass instead of uh, the force? No, 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 the force, if you apply force to this, imagine, uh, the wheel of fortune, you know the animation? When you run, when you, when you do the movement where you try to push the wheel into motion, so you grab the wheel and you throw it down, hoping to become magically rich by doing nothing. Uh, what happens is that then you apply a force. The force is going to translate into linear force, which doesn't do anything because the, the wheel is stopping, it cannot move, but it's also going to translate into torque. The torque is going to change L. So when you apply torque, you modify the L, which in, in the case of the wheel of fortune, it would just increase the magnitude of L but not the direction, because you, you don't try to, to, to break the wheel. Uh, it wouldn't move. It's probably designed to be not broken by a desperate customer or player. Okay, so, and this is like the, the this, is, this is very much like the, 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 the linear motion. You see why? So an object with mass rotate and, 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 but here we also have the size, the arc. So an object that's rotating, it has very high mass, very high velocity of rotation. It's going to be hard to stop or to, well, yeah, it's going to be hard to stop from rotation. Okay, so the angular momentum adds as well. This, once again, is very good news. So angular all the angular momenta, you, you add them together in a body. So you have a body made by a bunch of particles, ri, all going at a certain velocity, all with the, their own mass. The angular momentum is added. When I say that something can be added, it means that you can store just one for the whole body. Because if it adds, then you store just one for the whole body, it applies to the center of mass of the object, and that's it, you're done. Okay? Otherwise, you have to store a lot of stuff, which is not happy. All right. Oh, yes, of course. So, the derivative, I just ignore all the steps, unless you really want to, which is fine. But I'll explain this. Was would be kind of cool. Uh, the point is that, as I was saying, the way linear when, when I say this, the, the way linear momentum changes is the torque. So torque. What, what this really boils down to is that torque, which is r times the force at the point of application, is equal to how much the linear momentum changes. So when your object, when your spaceship, is Accelerating because the user presses the engine, all right? You take the position of the engine, which is R with respect to the center of mass, all right? You have a force that you're applying at the engine. This force is moving the whole ship. And if you want to see if it's rotating, you do the cross product between the force, the, the, the direction of the force and the position of the application, and that changes the linear momentum, all right? So if your engines are not perfectly in line with the ship, or you have lateral engines, then you can start your rotation, all right? Who's with me? Okay, all right. That's, that's good enough. All right. And indeed, so uh, all of this is kind of leading to. Do you guys want to take another break? Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, five more minutes. How much is left? Five. How much is left? Oh, yeah. I don't know. How many hours do you guys have? <laughs> None. <laughs> All the time in the world. Uh, we're going to do roughly 14 more minutes. To start the game. Do you know? Nope. Because I don't think today we're going to see differential equations. So, um, oh. Uh oh. Kaput. Just to make sure that you guys are enabled to at least start implementing something like this. Oh. Uh, do you know what the Euler integrator is? Yes. Right? So Presumably most of you will have a game loop in some framework of your free choice because I absolutely don't care. Uh, and you'll have your positions, your velocities or linear momenta, and the rotation metrics, and the angular momentum, and so on. Okay? And you'll compute the derivatives with the formulas that we have seen. So, so far, we've seen, okay, you have the state of the object, how do you compute its derivatives, right? Now, let's say you have the position x, which is a vector, oh, sorry, a vector in 3D, and you have the velocity v, that you have computed somehow, usually the position divided by the mass, okay? Right? What, how do you put these together? Of the object to rotate around an arbitrary axis is not just a number, 
remember, the, the metal pole example. It's not just a number, because the tendency to rotate like this is a number. The tendency to rotate like this is something else. And the tendency to rotate like this is something else, right? Or imagine a metal disc, right? There's plenty of ways to rotate that, and th th the energy that it takes is, is very different, all right? So what we are going to focus on now is the center of mass and then the way rotation is expressed around the center of mass. And this is one of the biggest challenges in building a physics engine, understanding how the inertia tensor works. But it's also one of the, the most gratifying. All right, so, well, the idea of the center of mass is rather simple. Do we really need to keep track of all the particles that make up a rigid body? No, absolutely not. That's pointless. Mostly because uh, the, inter the interesting quantities like the velocity or the linear momentum or the, or the, the angular velocity or um, the angular momentum, they sum across all the particles. So we just need to track the sum. It's as if saying that the body moves as and rotates as if it were a single tiny particle at, at its own center of mass, right? So the center of mass is actually uh, computed as the weighted sum of the masses of all the particles of the body. So suppose you your body is a rather simplistic body made up of three molecules, okay? One is here, it's very heavy, one is here, it's very light, and another one is here, and it's very light as well, okay? So where is the center of mass going to be? It's going to be roughly here, okay? Right? So, but, but that's also kind of obvious. So if you, if you push the object, its movement and rotation are going to be focused on the point of, of, of center of mass, right? Can you configure this out? Can you figure pushing, uh, or even a, a long metal pole with, with something very heavy on one side and something very light on the other side, okay? And the heavier the heavy part is, the more the center of mass is going to be close to it, okay? What about a perfectly balanced object? Center of mass is going to be the center, all right? In the geometric center. Geometric center is just the average of all the points. Nice to compute a bounding sphere, for example. The center of mass is not the center of geometry. It's the average, yeah, it's indeed the average of all the particles. So imagine you have just two particles, x1 and x2, with mass respectively m1 and m2, right? Is this formula clear? How clear from 1 to 10? 17. So the idea is that, so, and you, you, could, you could split this into, maybe this, this may be a, a, even a bit more intuitive, m1 divided by the total mass plus x2 times m2 divided by the total mass, where the total mass is course M1 plus M2, right? Mm -hmm. This is rather possible to do this, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so it, you see this it is a weighted sum after all. Okay. Uh, oh yes, indeed. Uh, if you have lots of weights, lots of particles, then you just do a summation. Where the mass so the center of mass, x uh, x bar, x average is the sum of all the particle positions multiplied by the respective mass divided by the total mass, all right? This is just a generalization of the, the previous thing. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Uh, now. Say what now? Sorry? <laughs> just for people who want to check it out later in the privacy of their own homes. Okay, and indeed, so now we can actually give a precise description of how you apply force. So when you apply force to an object, some of this force is going to set the object in motion, some of this force is going to make the object rotate. Which and which? Well, we, we compare the position of application of the force. So we have the force, we're applying the force at a position PF, center of mass of the object, is x bar. So, you take the relative position, so the position from the uh, application to the center, so we're, we're forgetting where the center is, we're centering the object at the origin by subtracting xf. 
and the dot product of the force of the so this is the external force that we're applying. The dot product of the external force times the relative vector is going to be the actual force. So this is only going to contribute to the linear motion of the object, whereas the cross product between fx and the relative vector is going to contribute to the rotation. All right? Now, this is something that should be... Oh, come on, yeah, okay, we're going to put it here. Um, now, what, what does this really mean? The dot product of a vector against an R1. <coughs> it's a projection, all right? Who knows this? Who, does, who doesn't, actually? When I ask something like who doesn't, if you don't raise your hand, I just assume that you know and I go on. So it's a survival measure to, sit, to raise your hand. Who does? The first one, the first part, uh, with the dot product, is that the, the, the translation get out of that force? Sorry? Is that the translation? Yeah. The translation of motion, yes, yes. And the second part is the actual rotation. Yes, indeed. So, drawing time. This is the object. This is x. This is the point. Oh. This is the point of application. So we apply the force here. Point of force. Okay? And the force is in this direction. My god, my god. Okay, this is the force of application. Right? The, 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 the direction of the force. So what's going to happen? Well, you can imagine a bit is going to rotate and, and, and a bit of the force is going to cause a rotation, a bit of the force is going to cause a movement. Right? Can you see? Alright, good. So, uh, the, rota the, the movement part, the movement part is going to take the projection of this vector, so the force vector, we can divide it into two other vectors. So I'm going to just redraw uh, or also, yeah, it's a bit better if we draw it like this. Very same thing, right? Just move it. So now I draw again the vectors. You have F here, and you have PF here, right? Or actually, this is PF minus X. You with me? Right? So we take the projection of F onto PF minus X. Right? This vector, which is this vector here, you see it? You see this? This, uh, this vector here, that is how much for. You see that it's shorter than F, right? Because not all F is going into the linear part. A part of F is just going into, is, is going into the rotation. Okay? Then, another vector, which is the perpendicular part, so the remaining part, is actually this one. This perpendicular part is the one that's going to contribute to the rotation. And that vector there is the rotational vector. It has to be perpendicular to both PF minus X and, um, and, and the application of the force. So, so the piece taking out. Sorry? Oh yeah, absolutely. The, that's wrong. The arrow is not. So that's the length of the vector actually. So the length of the vector is the the the, 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 the dashed line, but the direction is of is of course perpendicular. So the direction of the axis of rotation is going to be is going to be upward. So the axis of rotation is of course going to be coming out. So you see an arrow coming out. And the length of the vector is going to be the remaining part. It's going to be the sign of, uh, uh, of the angle between fx and pf minus x. All right. Now just one tiny note. The dot product gives you, so to say, the cosine between the angle of two vectors. And the, cro uh, the cross product gives you the sign. You do know this, right? Yeah. yeah. Indeed. And, and you can see that we're splitting the force. One part is the cosine. The cosine with respect to the angle is the part, how much of the force goes into linear motion. The sine of the force, but perpendicularly to the application of force and the point of application, is 
how much force goes into the rotational part. Right? And what's the sum between yeah, what's the sum between the two? Yeah, the, the total force applied. It's obviously a good bit. Okay? Alright. So, but of course, so now we know the torque, and you know from this thing I was writing here that the torque, I'm going to go the easy way, the torque just changes the angular momentum, alright? But now, the angular momentum has to, has to be translated into, into a velocity. So we'll go there. Or actually, you know what? I'll take another break. Another? Yes. It was just half an hour. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, I know, but before a very hard thing, it's a smart idea to take a break. Ah. Okay. Uh, now, the moment of inertia in two dimensions is a value which we call I, which represents the tendency of the body in the to resist rotation. Now, if you're walking, working in one in two D or one D, if you want, you only have one choice for rotation, right? So, in the same x y axis, and the way you, so do not you don't really need to learn uh, you don't really need to learn this. But the idea is that if you have an object. Uh, and its particles are in positions xi at yi with mass, uh, with mass mi, uh, the moment of inertia is going to be the masses multiplied by the square distances, the square relative, uh, the square distances from the center of mass. All right. What this means is that indeed, if you, uh, uh, the, the, the more ma mass changes the tendency of the object to resist rotation linearly whereas shape geometry changes that quadrat quadratically so if you have a very large object it's going to resist rotation a lot even more than an object with, uh, uh, with, with, with bigger mass and you can just get this one single number which says how much you resist rotation so just like you would have uh, so uh, just here as you have that the velocity in the 3D or in 2D is equal to the linear momentum divided by the mass, you would have that the angular, uh, the, the angular momentum would be equal to the, sorry, the angular velocity would be equal to the angular momentum divided by I. I is kind of like mass for rotation, you know? Right? So, a lot of momentum and a big mass means a little velocity, right? A lot of angular momentum, but a very big resistance, call it resistance to rotation in your mind, because this is what it is. I is the resistance of an object to rotate, which is a bit mass and a bit geometry. In 3D, of course, suddenly we can rotate we can rotate around how many axes in 3D? Yes. And does that sound like a good thing to you? No. No, no, of course. So, uh, the problem is that uh, this makes everything much more difficult. To, this makes everything harder to, 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 to think about because, whereas in 2D we have just a number, so the equation is the very same between the linear momentum and the angular momentum. Instead of having the mass, now you have um, the, 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 the moment of inertia, right? Just one number that says you resist to rotating. And the number is two, all right? That's it. But in this case, a number is not enough anymore. We have plenty of numbers. So let's consider first of all a single particle, which is loca uh, located at the relative position r, and it's moving with with velocity v. Now this is the velocity of the particle. So worse than usual. Oh, no. This is documented on camera. This is this is horrible. Okay, so uh, you have R. This is the position. Remember, R always represents uh, the the relative position with respect to the to the center, and the particle is moving at this velocity. Okay. This is the velocity of the particle, and you know 
that the current, the current velocity of the particle. And you know that the current velocity of the particle derives with respect to rotation from W times R. We've seen this before. So you have the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is this one. You have R and the velocity. You do know the right hand thingy. Yeah. It does, right? Yeah. Oh, guys, seriously? Yes, we know. Yes. Okay, so the velocity is obviously going to be this one. So this is W, this is R, and this is the velocity that results. Okay? So, how much angular momentum does... Do not look at this one. Yes, it's scary, I know, but do not look at it. <laughs> okay? So, the linear momentum, the, the angular momentum, and we've seen this before, is R times mv which is the linear momentum projected uh, against the axis, cro uh, crossed against the axis. Now, we know that the, the, the velocity is equal to W times R. Look, we've just done a simple sub substitution. So we know from the definition of linear momentum, this is the linear momentum, uh, the angular momentum of our particle. And the velocity of the particle depends, of course, on the, on the angular velocity. So you can go from the angular velocity to the linear velocity and back with a cross product. So we're just doing a translation, the transformation. So you have to cross R and V and W, and then you have to cross again with R, and then you multiply by M. All right? So this is the linear momentum. And, but what you would really like to do is you would like to express the linear momentum in terms of some quantity, just like it was with the linear momentum. You had mass times velocity. We would like to have something which is the equivalent, which is similar to mass times angular velocity. Because then our life becomes much easier. And this something that we don't really know yet what it's going to be, this something just says how much the object tends to resist rotation around an arbitrary axis. So you give the matrix. Uh, an angular velocity, you multiply it by the matrix, and it's going to answer you what the tendency is going to be to rotate around all the three axes. What, what, what happens is that with, with a bit of algebra, this is just, you just write it down, you multiply, and you see that the result is as if you had multiplied W by a matrix which we call J, which I can now, with the power of technology, make appear. Uh, and this matrix looks like this where x, y, and z are actually the positions of vector r, of course. So we have a way, you can derive this yourself if you want. Not fun at all, actually. It's very easy to get from, but you can do it. So the point is, if you just do this multiplication, you see what happens to w, you extract it, and you build a matrix that does the same multiplication. And now, what happens is that L for just a single particle is equal to J times W. Right? Just a single particle, the particle X, Y, Z. Just like P equals to M M MV. You see this, the similarity? So, uh, this is uh, the mass of the freight train makes it dangerous, even if it's slow, right? A huge value J makes a rotating object dangerous even if its angular velocity is, is small, right? Okay, but it accounts for the shape, so the reason why we need a, a, a whole matrix is that the shape of the object means that it can rotate, in, uh, it resists rotation in very complex manners. You can reason a bit about the values, but you don't really need it. Very nicely, we know that L, this is a stroke of luck that makes it doable to build games. We know that L is equal to the summation for all the particles of the, 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 the angular momentum of the various particles. So if you have a bunch of particles and you want to know the, the angular momentum of the whole body, you just add them. But if you know that Li is equal to Ji times the angular velocity, but the angular velocity is just one for the whole body, so you can group that out what happens is that this is equal to the summation of all the j's times w. It looks like a red. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Als je er geen in hebt. Is dit clear? No. So far. What this means is that if you have every particle and you compute this thing for the particle and you sum all these matrices together, you get a single matrix, which we call, not surprisingly, just J. So this one here in the slide is actually Ji, because we were talking about a single particle. You sum them all together and you have the rotational distribution of mass for the whole body. <coughs> that is the only quantity you have to store. So the constants of the body are the mass and its J moment of inertia. All right? Okay. All right. So, to sum this up, the kinematics of the whole body, this is an implementation slide, even if it doesn't look like it, are you store the position and you integrate that like this, with respect to the velocity. For the moment, you can integrate it like this. This is not really going to work nicely, but it's going to give you an idea. It looks like it's working for the first couple of minutes of simulation, possibly even less. Uh, you have the velocity, but you do not store the velocity in the body. You store the position and the linear momentum. The velocity, you compute it from the linear momentum. And then you take the linear momentum and you integrate it from the force. Compute it like this. So you can now have, and this is already a big achievement, this is going to already feel like almost a physics engine. You can have something where you have an object, but you can have, you can build the physics of a spaceship. You can do space physics, right? The, the, the force applied, you can have the engines, for example, like this, you can choose whatever you want. Whatever you find fun, do that as the assignment, as long as you put the physics right. Uh, so here you could have the force and you could have different engines that you activate with different keys so that you can have the ship that moves and rotates in different manners. Now, the rotate, so this was for the movement part. When it comes to the rotation, the rotation is integrated from the angular velocity. So you compute r dot, which you then use to integrate r directly as w times t, w times n, and w times b. And you use these as the columns. So you take the columns of the rotation matrix, you cross product with w, and these are the columns of the new matrix. Then, you take this matrix here, you invert it, and you multiply by l, and you get the angular velocity. So this was the very super hard question, and the answer, the answer is j minus 1 times l. Sorry? Yes. Where, where this is the inverse. Why is this? Is, is this intuitive enough? So you have that P is equal to M times V. So when you need the velocity, because in the body you store the position and the linear momentum. So you store X and V. And when you need the velocity, you recompute it, uh, you recompute it by doing P divided by M. And then you have that the linear momentum is equal to j times w. So you integrate over L, you get the new value of L, and now you need the new value of W to integrate the, the rotation. So W is going to be equal to j minus 1 times L. So basically V and W are just temporary variables in your update loop. You do not store them in your body. You don't need them. You can store them for convenience, but they are not where you keep your information. The information is kept into P and L. Alright? Alright, so thank you for the attention and pleasure.